everyone. Thank you so much for having me here at Thinking Gender 2024. Um, I'm Mei Yi Lu, and today I will share with you a close reading of Maya Deren's Meshes of the Afternoon. I'm sure most of the scholars here are familiar with this image in the film. The picturesque hillsides of Los Angeles, dotted with California bungalows and adorned with affordable craftsman furniture and built-in cabinets, encapsulate a quintessential image of American suburbia that emerged in the wake of World War II. Within this familiar setting, Maya Deren's experimental film, created in collaboration with her husband at the time, Alexander Hamid, in 1943, offers a provocative reimagining of the domestic space. Through the character portrayed by Darren herself, who traverses a surreal sequence of events upon returning home, encountering menacing figures and various versions of herself, the film delves into the depths of female psychosexual desire within the domestic realm. This expressive exploration of subjectivity situates meshes of the afternoon as a pioneering example of what P. Adam Sidney termed psychodramatic trans films, a style that emerged in the 1940s. Meshes also serves as a critique of women's experiences with domesticity, a topic often overlooked within the cultural milieu of its time. At a juncture when women's representation was predominantly linked to the wartime campaigns, urging their participation in workforce, Darren's film shines a light on the complexities and challenges in inherent in domestic life for women. Although the film was made during the wartime, Darren's portrayal of women of female subconscious and domesticity offers a stark portrayal that foreshadows the post-war American dream, exposing the very nightmares within the subconscious, the dream itself. Through a close analysis of the film's choreography, cinematography, and spatial dynamics, especially as they evolve with each iteration of Darren's character entering the house, I would argue that Meshes implants a feminist critique that emerges as a powerful testament to the complexity of female experience and the fragility of identity within the seemingly tranquil veneer of suburban life. I wanted to feature this quote by Jean Laplanche and J.B. Pontalise from Fantasy and the Origin of Sexuality. Um, their concept of the desubjectification of the subject in fantasy and a portrayal of fantasy as a setting for desire rather than its object has been instrumental in guiding my research. So I'm going to revisit this quote later after I um, finish up the analysis of the film. Maya Darren has inspired many male authors such as Kenneth Anger, Curtis Harrington, and David Lynch, who in their own ways continue to dissect the complexities of American identity. David E. James argues that crime and social fears in Hollywood narrative films serves a structural function similar to the, the dream state or descent into madness found in avant-garde cinema. Both feature a sub somnambulous protagonists navigating a menacing, often incomprehensible environment in search of sexual, social, or legal identity. These states share characteristics such as deadened affect and increased capacity for absorbing or inflicting violence, iconographies of entrapment, and the dissolution of geographic boundaries. Dissociated body and the disintegration of individual subjectivity has been representing cultural anxiety largely for the instability of patriarchal order. However, unlike the portrayal of fatal women in classical film noir such as Double Indemnity, Darren's, film, Dar Darren's dream sequences subverse the object-subject relation, re-evaluating the idea of female subjectivity and acknowledging the inner conflicts and compromises within it. Throughout the dream sequences, there are four versions of the woman played by Maya Darren. In the opening sequence, the woman never shows her entire body. The woman is either represented as a shadow reaching to the flower in the exterior space or through point of view shots that allows the audience to identify with her perception of the interior space. A POV shot hangs around the enclosed inner household where curtains blocks the window completely. In this sequence, a misplaced and off-the-hook telephone stands out, symbolizing a paraparaxis that interferes with the smooth order of ritual, which evokes an interiority fraught with desires that eventually will lead to violence. 
Passing by the telephone, the protagonist ascends the stairs to the upstairs cabinet, representing the innermost, most private part of the house and her unconsciousness. As she walks up, a running phonograph appears, um, as the second paraparaxis of which Darren responded by adjusting the needle before falling asleep on the couch. The scene concludes with another POV shot of the peaceful hillside landscape, overlaid with a shutter effect suggesting her closing her eyes. The use of subjective point of view shots, fragmental body parts, and shadow reflections blurs the boundary between first and third person, representing an ambiguous state of self-identification that remains repressed. In the second series, Darren's double pursues a cloaked stranger with a mirror face who carries the flower from the first series along the hillside road. Fragments of her body and the shadows intercut with her face as she chases the stranger, transitioning to a third person perspective as she halts by the house. Inside, everything appears orderly except for the knife, now misplaced on the staircase where the telephone had been in the first series suggesting a paraparaxis that evokes Darren's deeper violent desires. As she ascends the staircase and enters the cabinet, cabinet bedroom through the window, discovering the hidden, hidden knife, her body seemingly loses weight and she is pulled back to the staircase, observing her sleeping self on the couch through a first-person perspective. She becomes aware of her trapped subjectivity within the domestic relationship. As the protagonist in the third series opens the door, the, camera panning, the camera's panning captures a glimpse of the clothed stranger walking directly upstairs toward the bedroom. As the woman follows her upstairs, the camera oscillates intensely, creating a distorted effect on the domestic space. This suggests that the household structure is no longer stable. The spatial structure imposes limitation on the woman preventing her from seeing into the bedroom from, from the staircase and ultimately keeping her at a voyeuristic distance. Upon identifying the cloaked stranger's mirror face and witnessing her placing the flower on the bed, the stranger vanishes. In the fourth round, Dara enters the house with a knife. She encounters her other self at the kitchen table and reveals her desire to kill when the key transforms into a knife. As she moves through multiple exterior spaces and approaches the first, first, first version of herself sleeping on the couch, the killer suddenly transforms into a man who awakens her from the nightmare. Yet, as she follows him to the bed in the cabinet that hurls the flower-turned knife, the truth emerges that the man is, that the man is but a mirror reflection, shattered by the knife and revealing her, his fragmented image. The scene shifts to mirror pieces cascading onto a beach, swept away by the ocean tide. In the last sequence, assumed to be reality, the man enters the house and discovers from, the, from his subjective point of view that a woman has been killed by herself. In these final two sequences, Alexander Hamid portrays the man who is suggestive of the protagonist's husband. As the journey progresses, each time the protagonist becomes more aware of a desire to kill. It suggests that the otherness embodied by the cloaked stranger and the man is ultimately herself in different forms. Um, and this self-other relation depicted by the multiplicity of self also evoke a feminist utopia for reimagining the relation between body and desire. When Darren's character holds a knife that, click, that aims at the body of her other self sleeping unrestfully on a couch, cutting to the shot of a knife on her bed that reflects her distorted face, the conscious and the, the unconscious, body and desire, are juxtaposed in attention. Now let's get back to uh, the quote earlier. Um, Laplanche and Pondelis argues that fantasy is not so much a narrative that enacts the quest for an object of desire as it is a setting for desire, a place where con conscious and unconscious, self and other, part and whole meet. Therefore, illuminated by this idea of fantasy, the dream in Darren's cinematic space is a place of fantasy where desubjectified subjectivities oscillates between self and others, occupying no fixed place in the scenario. Therefore, the women, the men, and the cloaked strange, the cloaked figure in the dream space um, 
represent a state of desubjectification through confusing and confounding selves. It provides a subversive lens for depathologization of female multiplicity and schizophrenic motive across the various representations. And to wrap up my presentation, I hope it clarifies how Darren subverts the conventional portrayal of women within domestic spaces by unraveling the multiplicity of the female subject. The film's dream sequences and fragmented narrative structure allows the viewer to witness the protagonist's shifting identities and desires. As she enters and re-enters the house, each journey reveals a new facet of her interior self. Based on the analysis, I tried to demonstrate how Darren's work underscores the duality of confinement and liberation within domestic spaces, a reflection of the dystopian reality and feminist utopia.